Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Listen, people have asked, why would God allow the coming one world order? Well, the thing is, if you've never read the entire Bible from cover to cover, you probably wouldn't understand. But if you read in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve were disobedient, and God allowed the disobedience, but the thing is, they suffered the consequences of disobedience. You know, he, the, the Lord God always gives you instructions to protect us, just like a mother and a father tells a young child, always look both ways before you cross that street so a car doesn't hit you. Well, same thing. Of course, the devils that run the world and, their, and the media will tell you, well, you know, just like in Genesis 3, the serpent, which was really the devil and Satan, will tell you, oh, well, God's trying to hold you back. I'm trying to give you his secret knowledge. Well, that's a lie. So God allowed Adam and Eve to disobey, but there were consequences. And then God took Israel out of captivity in Egypt and offered to be their king and fight their wars for them. Do you know there were times when uh, the, the Israel was fighting the Canaanite tribes and God actually threw down stones from heaven to wipe out their army? And you know, all the miracles that he showed them in, in Egypt, uh, which the plagues of Egypt parallel the plagues of Revelation. I mean, it, in a lot of ways, not completely. I don't understand why. I know there's some very similar, uh, strong similarities. But then in the book of First Samuel chapter 8, the people said, oh, well, we don't want God as our king. We, we want a human earthly king. And in verse uh, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. In other words, go ahead and listen to what they're saying. Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee. But they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And we're not talking about raindrops falling from the sky. We're talking about ruling and reigning, uh, being a king. Now, when you read Job chapter 1, now the thing is, Satan went to God and said, put a challenge before him. And told him, well, yeah, of course Job, uh, you know, follows you. You've, you've protected him. And basically, he's, Satan issues a challenge and says, you know what? You let me touch all that he has. And Job will curse you to your face, God. And, uh, of course, God said, well, okay, let's, let's, I'll, I'll take up your, uh, your little bet here. Uh, that's the Bob translation, but uh, he was not. Satan was not allowed to touch his life. And if you were interested, you could read the rest of the story. So, why is God going to allow the new world order? Well, we've been disobedient. We have failed to honor God the Father and Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, and. We haven't followed his ways and his laws. So my opinion is, hey, you guys don't want me for a ruler? No problem. I'm going to let you have Satan for your ruler. The beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Let's see how you like it. And the ultimate conclusion is going to be, will you worship the beast? Will you take his mark? All right, well, that's, this is the introduction. Please continue listening 
and you can hear why God allows the New World Order. Hello, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. This is going to be a Bible study on why the Lord is going to allow Satan's kingdom to the world. It's called the New World Order. At least that's what the uh, most the unsaved people call it. But the uh, I first came to see Satan's kingdom. I didn't understand the Bible then. I didn't believe the Bible then. But it was in the um, the mid to late eighties when uh, Oliver North. And uh, Secord and what was her uh, the girl I forget, but Colonel Oliver North admitted on C-SPAN, like middle of the week, probably about two two o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere around there, one thirty two o'clock in the afternoon, admitted on in front of a room full of reporters and congressmen, TV cameras, radio, newspaper people, admitted that he had traded the Contras guns for cocaine, since they didn't have any cash, but they had cocaine. And then the congressman asked him, well, what did you do with all that cocaine, Colonel North? And he says, well, sir, we, um, yeah, we, uh, well, what we did, uh, we um, uh, we uh, uh, sold it on the um, uh, world world market. Well, I ask you, what what country is the world market for cocaine? Uh, duh, the USA. He was a drug he was a drug pusher. And this was like you know maybe a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday, right? And I'm waiting. Uh, I didn't particularly like Reagan as president. I didn't really like him. Uh, so I'm thinking, wow, Reagan is toast. And I waited and waited and waited. And, you know, I figured a couple days later it was going to be front page news in the newspaper. Uh, Reagan administration sells, uh, sells cocaine and trades it for drugs, uh, for uh, guns. And not a word in the newspaper, not a word in the radio, not a word in the TV. All three major networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, were indeed at those congressional hearings. It's not like they didn't understand what he said. They knew. I mean, I caught it, and I wasn't even halfway paying attention. I just had it on for noise. Well, I was, I think I was getting ready for work, if I remember correctly. I worked uh, the afternoon shift back then. I was going to college, working two jobs, my white privilege. Well, I was shocked. Two weeks later, I'm still waiting for this news to hit the, the papers. Nothing. It was that day, it was then, that I understood that the government and the news media were one, basically one and the same. Well, I started doing some research and uh, found out that there were cures for cancer, and uh, trace that back to the pharmaceutical companies, and trace that back all to the media with the banks, the banks and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies. Those are three of the most profitable com companies in industries in the United States. Well, once I traced it back to the banks, it was like an octopus. They had their hands in politics, they had another hand in pharmaceutical, another hand in the media. Uh, they owned, I mean, let's face it, people, the largest English publisher of Bibles in the English-speaking world is Zondervan. And they're owned by HarperCollins, which is owned by the News Corporation, which is... Fox TV, Rupert Murdoch, 
Zondervan prints the NIV Bible, which was the largest selling English Bible in the world for at least one year. I don't know if it still is. But their parent company, HarperCollins, prints The Joy of Gay Sex and the Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan, founded on June 6, 66, 1966, by Anton Levy, L-E-V-E-Y. Yes, he's Jewish. But he changed his name to LeVay because they, didn't, they want to change their names to protect the guilty. Well, one day I'm uh, sicker than a dog in a doctor's office and um, trying to take some treatments that are illegal in the United States, but they're legal in Europe, and they've been curing cancer, um, basically ozone and what have you, intravenous ozone. And um, there's some doctors over there that have 85-90% cure rates for cancer over in Europe, but they won't allow the treatments over here. And the doctor, if he knew, knows that you took chemotherapy and radiation in the United States, will absolutely not take you as a patient because, you know, you destroyed your body and he doesn't want to take you and have you die and then blame him for the loss, right? So I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and uh, I'm sitting next to an, an elderly couple. And I start telling them about uh, the New World Order. At, I don't think we called it that back then. I knew what the illuminated ones were. And they're like, oh yeah, we know all about that. I'm like, really? Because almost nobody knew this stuff back in the 80s. I mean, there was a few people, but you know... Uh, this was before the internet. I mean, I didn't start... Uh, they had internet, but it was nothing like what it is now. Basically, back in the 80s, the uh, internet uh, was um, basically just games. I mean, that was it. And they were a really kind couple, and they were like, well, yeah, you, the... Um, one world government thingy is coming, and uh, it was all foretold in the Bible. And I'm like rolling my eyes. I'm like, oh, no, you're a bunch of church people. You know, because uh, I had been abused by the churches, and, you know, uh, they're um, the Antichrists are God's chosen people, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, Read the book of uh, Revelations, chapter 2 and verse 9, where Jesus says uh, about the um, synagogue of Satan, okay? I mean, I'd had that Zionism garbage beaten into my head at the Baptist church, and I thought, wow. And I grew up with a bunch of uh, people that claimed to be Jews, and I'd never met such a greedy bunch of people in all my life. I mean, I, every time I would cut the grass or do something for them when I was a kid, they'd always find a way to beat you out of money. I mean, it was like, these are God's chosen people? Then God is Satan. That, I used to say that as a, as a young teenager. I used to say that, you know. Well, if these are God's chosen people, then Satan is God. Little did I know how close to the truth I was back then. So, you know, that's, uh, that's how I found out about it. But uh, these people were very kind, and they put up with my abuse. I, I didn't cuss them out out of respect for their age, but I wanted to because I thought, church people, oh, you people are disgusting. Because, you know, I used to watch the TV evangelists on Sunday morning Praise of Jesus. Let's send send God your send God your tithe. Here's my address. Praise of Jesus. I used to watch that junk uh, occasionally, you know, flipping through the channels trying to find my cartoons on Sunday morning, right? Well, these people they were very kind and they they uh, took out a piece of paper and they wrote down a bunch of Bible verses, you know, chapter and verse. I mean, they knew their Bible pretty darn well. And they says, you know, and he says, the one world government was foretold in the Bible thousands of years ago. Here, look this up. 
And matter of fact, the verse that really touched my heart was Revelation 2.9, where Jesus said, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And I was like, wow, how come I went to Bible school, uh, went to, I went to um, a Baptist junior high school in, what was it, 10th? 10th grade? Yeah, 10th grade. Never heard that verse. Never heard that verse. And I was like, wow, boy, that, that, that sounds just like the Jewish neighborhood I grew up in near Miami, you know? And uh, so I took that little piece of paper and I uh, went to the hotel room because I wasn't in the town I lived in. And praise the Lord for the Gideons. There was a Gideon's Bible in the dresser drawer right next to the bed and I opened it up. I had no idea where the books were in the Bible, but I went to the table of contents and I started looking it up, you know, okay, this is in Gen Genesis and uh, this is in Daniel and this is in Matthew 24 and this is in Revelation and yeah, let's see, this is in Ephesians, this is in Thessalonians and I looked up every single verse and that night I was like, wow, the Bible does foretell the coming of the one world government. And that was the night that I got on my knees by the bed and said, you know, because I used to consider myself a Christian back when, um, when I was in junior high school. But I renounced Christ when I went to high school and discovered drugs and girls and beer denounced him, blasphemed the Lord Jesus Christ. But in that hotel room, I got on my knees and I begged for the Lord's forgiveness. And, you know, the Bible says he's a gracious God, slow to anger and quick to forgive. Good thing for us. So, what can I tell you? In Psalms 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And then Psalms 145, and verse 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. So, the Lord is slow to anger, but when he does get angry, look out. All right, so let's take a look. In Genesis chapter 1, and verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, the sixth day is the day that the Lord took the dust out of the earth and created Adam. So, Adam was, I believe, if memory serves me correctly, because I don't want to make this a five or six hour Bible study, and I could do it if I had to. This might be my um, last Bible study for a while. I'm moving. I'm not going out of state, but I am moving locally in the same area. Um, I've got a crushing mor mortgage that I need to get out from under. And uh, hopefully within a year, year or so, year and a half, I can retire and then start doing ministry stuff more full time. But um, I was going to move out of state, but it looks like the uh, it fell through, um, which is fine. Everything's in the Lord's hands. But I believe that Adam was the last thing, the last creation of the Lord. And... It said that the, uh, and 
you know, and God saw everything that he'd made. Behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Adam was created on the sixth day. On the seventh day, the Lord rested. Now, if you read Genesis 1, day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, the angels are nowhere in there being created. It doesn't say anything about the angels being created. It says on day one, you know, you heavens and the earth. You know, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Adam and Eve. And then day seven, the Lord rested, his Sabbath. And that was the end of the creation. By the end of the sixth day, that was the end of the creation. The, the Bible does not record the angels being created anywhere after the earth was made in the first six days. If you read Job 38, it said that the sons of God and the stars uh, shouted for joy at the foundation of the earth. You can read it yourself. I want you to know the Bible is not the book of the angels. The Bible is the book of Adam. Okay? Angels are mentioned in the Bible. Satan is mentioned in the Bible. But the Bible is the book of Adam. The Adam of the flesh is the first Adam. Jesus Christ is called the last Adam. Let's face it, people. The Bible is from cover to cover about Jesus, who is the Christ. The Bible declares that all things were made by Jesus. And that's, you know, and we're talking about Genesis 1. Christ created everything. He created Adam. And then when you get down to Revelation, the end of the book, it's his kingdom. Right? Let's prove that. Now, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but, um, uh, you know, I'm going to make some points here. And this might be one of the most important Bible studies you ever do in your life. And um, like I've said before, no, nothing I do is copyrighted. Matter of fact, I've changed all my videos to the Creative Commons, so anybody can download them and share them. All glory to Christ. I don't copyright nothing. I don't ask for money. Okay. But in John 1.1, 1, 1, we read the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So who, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The word of God made everything. Everything. That's the, the earth, Adam, the angels, everything. And you got the Jehovah's Witnesses that will try to make you think, that uh, Jesus was a created being who created everything for, for the Father. Wrong. Eh. Sorry. So, the Bible interprets the Bible. Who is the Word of God? Turn to Revelation verse nine, chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His own blood, right? And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is Jesus, people. The Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 is a book about Christ, the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So, all right, let's go take a look at Genesis. Oh, uh, let's see. We're going to go to Genesis. Uh, we'll figure it out. Give me a sec. All right, well, the point I was making is, in Job 38, when you read about the sons of God and the stars of heaven uh, shouting for joy at the foundation of the earth, they're angels, okay? Because the angels were there already when the earth was created. They were already there. And the Bible's not the book about the angels. The angels are mentioned, but the Bible's not about the angels. The Bible's about Jesus Christ and the children of Adam, okay? Because when you look through day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and then when you get to day six, let's take a look. In Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us, let us, not let me, he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. That right there just about puts a nail through the uh, gay pride thing, huh? And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Funny how the New World Order says, Oh, we got too many people. We got to kill them all. But God said, And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the field, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Now, if you ask me, when I read this, it looks to me that God gave them basically uh, fruit to eat. You know, they are basically vegetarians. To me, that's what it sounds like the original creation was supposed to be. You know, when you read this. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So... Green things, fruit and fruit, green things 
herbs and fruit. That was to be our meat. And God's, uh, Genesis 1 and verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we started in Genesis 1.28 and ended it in Genesis 1.31. People, the angels were already around. And when you go read, um, let's see, when you read Genesis 1.31, the point being, and God saw everything that he had made, mankind, the earth, the angels, everything. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, evidently, Satan had not fallen at this point. Now, I don't put a lot of st uh, stock in these extracurricular books. But I did read something that was kind of interesting in the book of Adam and Eve. This is just throwing it out there. I'm not saying I believe it. But it's a possible explanation. I think it's worth sharing. God created man in his image. Okay? Now, up to this point, everything was good. All the angels were, were created before the earth, in my opinion. I believe I could prove it, but I don't want to do a half-hour study proving that. I believe the angels were created prior to the earth. Job 38, they shouted at the creation of the earth. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, boom. Every All the animals and trees and all this other stuff was created. The birds, the fish, whatever. Day six, God creates man in God's image. Okay? And up to this point, there's no sin in the world. Satan hadn't fallen yet. Everything's nice, right? But in the book of Adam and Eve, if I remember correctly, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember exactly where it is. Sometime after the, the sometime around after day six, Satan fell. I somewhere between Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter three. Somewhere between those two places, Satan tried to overthrow God. There was war in heaven. He tried to kill God and take his place. And I've got a playlist on that, I think, uh, War in Heaven. You could, you know, it's, you, we can cover it. Isaiah 14 is one, um, one spot. There's another thing in Ezekiel. I'm not sure which which one it is, but, you know. Let's face it. Satan fell somewhere between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. How long was it? We don't know. The Bible does not give us the details. Just that on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, everything God had made was good. That included man. That included the earth. The angels everything. And then sometime after that, Satan fell, tried to kill God. There was war in heaven. Boom. In the book of Adam and Eve, Satan's persecuting Adam and making problems for him. And Adam asked Satan um, something to the effect, you know, why are you why are you making, you know, why are you, why do you hate me so much? What did I ever do to you? I'm paraphrasing, okay? And Satan was like, it's because of you, the reason I was cast out of heaven. He's like, what did I do? And according to the narrative, if I remember correctly, God told Satan to serve Adam. You know, a servant of Adam, because God created Adam in his own image. He says, servant, I want a Satan, I, uh, you know, whatever, Lucifer, whatever. I want you and your angels to serve my son, Adam. And Lucifer, or 
Satan decided, uh, he's an inferior being to me. He's inferior to me. I'm the anointed cherub. Adam should serve me. So he uh, got his angels together. That's mentioned in the book of Revelation where the dragon's tail drew the third part of the stars to the earth. We'll cover that later. And then there was war in heaven. Satan and his angels fought against Michael and his angels and prevailed not. So, I don't know if that's true, but you know what? Wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me if Satan did not want to serve Adam and rebelled. And Satan, believing that he was, you know, if he believed that he was a superior being and that Adam should serve him, you know, that would make sense, right? So, I don't know. That's just something I, I'm throwing out there. I'm not saying uh, I believe that. All right, well, let's read the next verse, which is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And God rested... As an example for us it wasn't because he was tired I've actually had people say oh yeah God was tired he he had rest on the seventh day because yeah he was just worn out you know really where's that in the Bible Genesis 2 and verse 3 and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made made these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that God, uh, that the Lord God made the heaven, the, the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, the um, sometimes what the Bible does, it will tell you an introduction of something, and then it'll skip around later and fill in the details. Okay. Because, you know, you, we just read where the Lord had rested. And then when we read in Genesis uh, 1 and 28, and 29, 30, 31, that male and female created he, him. Now, that was on the sixth day. Now, the Lord's going to, they're going to fill in all the blanks. Okay? Uh, let's see. Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Very, very, very interesting, as they used to say on Laugh-In. And if you remember that, you're old. Now, here's something your demon nominational preacher will never, never, never read in a sermon. Personally, I don't have to worry about a congregation firing me for being controversial because, A, I don't take donations and they don't support me. I work, I work a full-time job. But we're going to go to Ezekiel 31 and verse 1 and start there. 
we're going to, uh, they're talking about the trees in the garden. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what does the Bible say about trees? And I do, I, I did a video on uh, trees. I go into this in more detail. So let's read Ezekiel 31 and 1. Ezekiel is a wild book. I mean wild. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Who art thou like in thy greatness? Verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3. Okay, yeah, Ezekiel 31, verse 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. For those of you that don't know it, the Assyrian Empire came in by God's hand and invaded northern Israel and carried off the ten tribes captive. Oh yeah. They tried to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah and they carried away part of Judah. But they couldn't take Jerusalem. They couldn't do it. Uh, I believe that's in uh, Chronicles and Kings. The book of Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. I'd have to look it up. But we're not there yet. Okay? We are not there yet. There, this is. I'm not sure how long this Bible study is going to be. This is the introduction. Okay? But why is the Lord going to allow the New World Order? By the time you're done with this, you will have a pretty good idea. All right. So, and Israel and Judah were not the same people. They had different land areas. They had different kings. And they had wars against each other. Just like the Civil War in the United States. You had the North against the South. Well, Israel and Judah was the same thing. Except for Nor Israel was the North and uh, Judah was the South. Assyria took northern Israel into captivity, and Israel never returned to the land. The ten tribes, never. The southern kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem, they went into captivity by the Babylonians, not the Assyrians. They spent 70, 70 years in captivity. Uh, read the book of Je uh, Daniel and Jeremiah. Then after 70 years, they were released, and then you can read about them returning to the land under Ezra and Nehemiah. Yes, the Bible is uh, a book with some very interesting information that your demon nominational preacher just will not tell you about. Uh, they want you to just read John 3, 16, and uh, that's the Bible. That's the praise of Jesus. That's it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the end of the Bible to them. Wrong. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. The Assyrian's a tree, a cedar. A cedar is a tree, people. Behold, the, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowy, shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. Boughs is, uh, it's plants, people. Remember the, the song, uh, Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la. They sing that every December. Okay, verse four. The um, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants. They're talking about the Assyrians here, and they're talking about plants. And sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. I think I'm going to do is go to Revelation 
where it talks about the beast rising up from the sea. I think I'm going to cover that next. But the waters, remember that. And his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. The Assyrian Empire was one of the first empires. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen to this. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree, family tree, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Are they, is this a metaphor for family trees? Verse 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Let's read that again. Now, talking about the Assyrians, right? They haven't changed the uh, subject. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Huh. So do trees have envy? Envy is an emotion, people. Are these trees, family trees, figures of speech? Or do actual trees have emotions? Think about that. And it says here there were trees in uh, uh, the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God. They all envied him. Now, I had an 1890s book, a Bible college book, a theological book, um, I lost it because of, it was in storage. And a nice Jewish company bought the storage unit, and they, uh, well, it's a long story, but basically um, they said I didn't pay my bill, and I owed them a bunch of money, and they hit me with a bunch of fees and stuff. It was $22 a month. Come on. Next thing I know, for uh, a month's rent or whatever, they were like, you owe us $150. I'm like, what? So I lost this 1890s book. And this is how I found out about a lot of the stuff. But, you know, when the theologians of times past, before the uh, publishers of the Church of Satan, Satanic Bible, and the gay, the gay porn books bought up Zondervan, the largest English uh, Bible publisher in the English-speaking world, before the... Uh, New World Order bought up all the Christian publishers. You know what they believed about this verse? They believed there were other groups of people, family trees, in the Garden of God. That's what they actually believed. Now, I'm not telling you to believe that. I'm not telling you that I believe that. I'm just telling you what Bible scholars from over a hundred and something years ago believed. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Interesting. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height and he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs and his heart is lifted up in his height, pride, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. 
and strangers, the terrible of the nations. Do you know that word nations there is the same word that they translate the word Gentiles in the Old Testament? Goy and goyim. Goyim means nations. Sometimes the King James translator would take the same word translated nations. Other times they would translate it as Gentiles. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and in the valleys. His branches are fallen and his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. To that end, that none of all the trees by the waters, waters, exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot, shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height. All that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth. Hell, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. Wow. When's the last time you went to church and ever heard this preached, huh? Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. Not a mourning as in sad, as in, you know, not not first the, the light part of the day. In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him and restrained the floods thereof. And the great waters were stray, stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him. And all the trees of the field fainted for him. How can trees faint? I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him, unto them that be slain with the sword, that they that were his arm, that dwelled under his shadow in the midst of the heathen, to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet thou shalt be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord. How do trees get circumcised? Uh, they don't. All the trees in the garden envied him? You know, a lot of the Bible scholars of time past believe that there were other people besides um, besides Adam. You know? I don't know. I don't know if I totally believe that or not, but I mean, when you read this, when you read this, it makes you think. Adam and Eve, were they alone in the garden? You know, it's, it kind of makes you wonder. All right, remember we were reading about the waters, the waters, the waters. Well, let's use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, right? Waters, to whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, spiritual fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, made, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried him away, carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand 
full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, every single person almost on the face of this planet that teaches the Bible is going to tell you, oh, all these colors are the Catholic Church. And that's true. They are. But before the Catholic Church was in existence, the Levitical priesthood had these same exact things. Purple, scarlet, decked with gold, precious stones and pearls. Oh yeah. Before there was a Catholic Church, the Levitical priesthood was just like this also. Oh yeah. All right, so in Revelation 17, 14, we read, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Remember I said that Jerusalem and Judah went into captivity into Babylon? So what about this golden cup? Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Well, Bible interprets the Bible. Go to Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Did you catch that? Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad, insane, crazy, cray-cray. Oh, yeah. Remember? Mystery, Babylon, Jerusalem, the Jews, the Levitical priesthood, the priests, they went into Babylon for 70 years. Oh, yeah. And what did they pick up from Babylon? everything that the Lord hated. Matter of fact, the, um, when Jesus condemned the Jews for their tradition of the elders, their oral book, the tradition of the elders, is called the Babylonian Talmud. Talmud means learning. So you've got Babylonian learning. Huh. All right, let's read Revelation 17, verse 4 again. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, the colors of the priests, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. The Jewish priests used to wear this. Levitical priesthood used to wear exactly what they're talking about here. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her name was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Uh, Babylon was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Remember that, because we're going to go back to that. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Did you catch that? And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written 
in the book of life from the foundation of the world. You know, if the King James is right, and I read that right, there are people whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Think about it. Boy, that'll cause somebody head to spin. Verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which, on which the woman sitteth. And people are quick to point out, oh, the Vatican, the Rome, as they sit on seven hills. Well, that's true. Absolutely. Rome sits on seven hills. So does Istanbul, Turkey. Guess what? So does Jerusalem sit on seven hills. They'll never tell you that, though, will they? No, 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 no. Verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast." These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, Listen carefully about the waters. Listen carefully. Revelation 17 and verse 15. Chapter 17 and verse 15. Listen carefully. And he saith unto me, The waters, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, the waters that you saw where the whore sits, are people and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And that word nations in the Greek, here in the New Testament Greek, in the Old Testament, was written in Hebrew. The word nations, or nation, is Gentiles or Gentiles. Gentile or Gentiles. And in the Greek, where it says nations, same thing. Sometimes they translated the word nations, sometimes they translated it Gentiles. They weren't consistent. Uh, it's going goyim in Hebrew, and in the New Testament it's ethnos. And that's where we get the word ethnic group. Race, can anyone? Alright, verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You see, waters, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, in Ezekiel there, they were talking about trees that had emotions, and then they were talking about waters. A lot of symbolism. Where people get into trouble is where they try to define what the Old Testament means by using the New Testament. And you can't do that. you got to explain the, old, the New Testament by using the Old Testament, generally. Generally, that's true. The Old Testament, I've heard it said, is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, let's take a look at some other things. Alright, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. 
And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, sometimes the trees are talking about food, okay? No problem. I understand that. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Are these figures of speech for people, for someone? Is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is that Satan? Is the tree of life, is that Christ? I don't know. You know, there is a verse in the Bible about the, uh, the tree of life in Revelation. Let's take a look at that real quick. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 4, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Revelation 2 and verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 22 and verse 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielding her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and to enter in through the gates into the city. New Jerusalem, not the old one. All right. Uh, remember we talked about the, um, you know, Mystery Babylon killed the saints of God? Remember, we talked about that. Oh, yeah. Mystery Babylon killed the saints of God and the prophets. Let's take a look at that real quick. You know, if you use just the Bible alone um, to figure out who Mystery Babylon is, uh, th that's what I would suggest, using the Bible alone. Um, I know the Roman Empire was very evil. They killed a lot of people. Very evil. Catholic Church, ditto. Um, the uh, I kind of of the opinion that possibly the fourth kingdom that Daniel saw was perhaps the Ottoman Empire. That was a Muslim uh, type of empire. They conquered a huge territory. Matter of fact, they invaded Spain, they invaded uh, Vienna, Austria. Austria is just south of Germany. They conquered, I mean huge, they, they conquered uh, the eastern part of uh, Greece and the Roman Empire. Um, conquered it, I mean just totally killed Christians by the millions. Uh, that's that peaceful uh, Muslim Islam religion that they always talk about. But I believe it could have been the Ottoman Empire. They lasted for like 500 and something years. Um, they did not collapse until after World War I. Uh, they were a force to be reckoned with. Matter of fact, Russia, before they became communist, had a war with uh, Turkey, and Turkey whipped their rear ends. I mean, just whipped them bad. Um, they just wiped out their wiped out their army, I mean, terribly, with American-made Winchester lever-action rifles, you know, um, unbelievable. But the empire, the Ottoman Empire lasted for 400 years, but um, I believe, could believe that possibly it was the fourth ki kingdom of Daniel. Daniel's a very difficult book, I don't know. All right, so let's take a look at uh, uh, Mystery Babylon. Uh, Revelation 18.24, I'm going to be just covering parts of it, okay? And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The blood of prophets, okay? After Christ died, um, the only prophets you had were the apostles and Paul. That was it, okay? Prior to the Christ, it, all the prophets were 
the Hebrews of the Old Testament. So Babylon was responsible for the blood of prophets. Revelation 16, 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Revelation 17, and verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Mystery Babylon killed the prophets. Okay? So, who does Jesus say kill the prophets? Turn to Luke 13 and verse 33. Nevertheless, now this is Jesus speaking. I trust Jesus more than anybody else that walked on the earth. Jesus speaking, Luke 13, 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Wait a minute. The Bible says, Mystery Babylon shed the blood of prophets. But Jesus just said, that, it, For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Wow! Turn to Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. What? I thought it was Rome. Oh, 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 that's right. That's the uh, demon nominational people they, they, that don't believe Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicken under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. After Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, what has Judaism done? Absolutely nothing. Revelation 11 and verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Um, Jesus, my Lord, was crucified in Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Not Rome, not Mecca, not in Istanbul. So, who are we going to believe, Jesus or commentaries? I pick Jesus. Okay? How about Paul? 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14 through 16. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Did you hear that? Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Wow. If anybody can show me from the Bible alone where Rome or Islam killed the prophets, Please let me know. I do not like Rome. I know she's murdered many. Islam has is, Islam is murdered many. But they're not Mystery Babylon. They might be part of it, but they're not the root. However, Jerusalem is also built on seven hills, as is Moscow, communism, Istanbul, Islam, 
and Seattle, which is Microsoft. Okay. Uh, let's read Jesus' words again. Matthew 23, and verse 34, 35, and 36. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men. Jesus is speaking to Jerusalem. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, that's mistranslated. It should be said Catholic church or, or mosques, right? No, the King James translated it right. And some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacchaeus, son of Archias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say, upon, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Matthew 23, verse 37. Next verse. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And believe me, in 70 AD, when the Roman army, when the Jews rebelled, the Roman army came in, and destroyed Jerusalem, killed hundreds of thousands, from what I understand from history, and they burned the temple to the ground. And Matthew 24 was fulfilled when Jesus said that there would not be one stone left upon another. That was fulfilled in 70 AD when General Titus destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple to the ground, and cast down every stinking stone. And I'm sorry, the Wailing Wall is not part of the temple. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar. And I believe Jesus. All right, so in Genesis 2 and verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, are these trees living beings that have emotions, or are they actual physical trees? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what to think. But personally, I do believe Jesus is the tree of life. And I do believe the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because let's face it, Satan had knowledge of good. He did. Until he fell, but he also had knowledge of evil. Satan knew both sides of that coin, didn't he? But is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is that Satan? I don't know. And I'm not going to tell you it is. But if you uh, think it's an actual tree, fine. If you think it's Satan, that's fine too. Um, all right, well, this is probably going to be the end of the introduction for why God is going to allow the new world order. In a nutshell, the children of Adam do not want God as their king. In a nutshell, that's, that's, that's the name of that tune. And that's why God's going to say, oh, you don't want me as your king? No problem, you could have the other guy. No problem. We'll see how you like it. All right, well, this is uh, Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So, all right, I'm going to try to, um, we're going to be, next time when we do, when I do the, um, next part of the study we'll probably we're going to definitely go to genesis 3 um, the fall of uh, even adam so 
power, right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.